There will be no review as go back to part one and part two of Should a Christian Celebrate Christmas? We're going to pick up right where we left off last time. Go back and get the other videos. Get the audios. Send them out. You understand. You, you, you get listen to part one. Listen to part two. Why we're doing this. Where I got the information as I'm reading. We pick up number seven. Christmas Eve. Well, you, sounds innocent enough, doesn't it? What's wrong with Christmas Eve? Is there a is there a Thanksgiving Eve? Is there a Fourth of July Eve? What other Eves are there? Halloween Eve? Halloween Eve? -y? All right. Yule, you, however you want to say it, is a Chaldean word, Chaldean, Babylonian, meaning infant, baby. Long before the coming of Christianity, the heathen Ang Anglo-Saxons called the December 25th Yule Day. In other words, infant day or child's day. I think we have today in America a day for children. The day they celebrate the birth of the false messiah. The night before Yule Day was called Mother's Night. Today it is called Christmas Eve. And it wasn't called Mother Night after Mary, the mother of our Lord. Mother Night was observed centuries before Jesus was born. Semiratus. Capital S E M I R A M I S. If you were to study Semiratus, she's an interesting woman. So is her husband, Nimrod. Was the inspiration of Mother Night and Child's Day was to be supposed the birthday of her son, Tammuz, capital T A M M U Z, the sun god. Well, let me go back here and read again. It said that uh, this day was to be celebrated the eve. And then we read further that the next day was the sun, the children day, the sun god day, Tammuz. So Christmas, December 25th, is in honor of a god that is a small g-o-d, who is a son of, 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 of Nimrod. And they call him the sun god. That's bear worship. I hope, as a Christian, I hope you're not involved with this. If you are, I hope you repented in turn. And I hope you're, you're just in awe of what one day in a year and all this paganism. One day. December 25th, that Christians love and adore, and that one day, 24 hours, look at the mess we are in. Number eight. We've had the birthday of Jesus. Now let's have the resurrection of Jesus. And I'm not going to go to Easter or to Passover. Number eight. The Yule Log. The Yule Log was considered by the ancient Celts a sacred log to be used in the religious religious festivals during winter solstice. That I believe this year is the twenty first. The fire provided promises of good luck and long life. Have you looked at the word luck? Have you ever traced the word luck to Lucifer? You need to. Each year the Yule Log had to be selected in the forest on Christmas Eve. You mean Mother's Day? Uh, what was it called? Wait a minute. You wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hey, Mother's Night? Mother's Day? Is there a connection? You need to go to my website, my family website. You need to, to listen to the thing I've done, the wet blanket on Mother's Day. 
That's a serious thing, too. You know, people just do things without studying, without doing no history. And previous videos, you see my voice get angry. You see me shout. You see me get angry. You hear, you hear me, and you say, why? Because I'm at complete anger without sinning that pastors are in a pulpit and don't know history. They don't study this. You need to ask your pastor, have you ever read Babylon, Mystery Babylon by Hislop? Have you ever studied that? Because this is where most of this information is coming from. This guy that did this report is preventing me from giving you a headache from reading Hislop's book. I've studied the book. It is very great and it gives you a very great headache. That guy gives you documented histor historical facts. And why is it not taught in seminaries? Why is it not taught in Bible colleges? One of my classes was Babylon Mystery Babylon. Ask my family. Your pastor that involved in this Christmas mess does not know history, does not know his Bible. He does not and has not studied. Or else he would not have it in his church. Now getting back to ye old log. Ye old log. I'll go back to the beginning. Ye old log was considered by the ancient self. You're saying it wrong. I know where you want to say it. In this report, this guy, when it comes to it, he puts Xmas. I, I believe that. I don't want to say Christ man. Ancient Celts as a sacred log to be used in their religious festivals during the winter solstice. The fire provided promises of good luck and long life. Each year's Yule log had to be selected in the forest on Christmas Eve by the family using it. So what do you do today? You, the whole family goes out. I, listen, I went to this with my own parents. We went out, we would cut down our own tree from a tree farm, find a good one, and bring the saw. You know, I was I got to carry the saw as my mom went out there looking for the trees, and my father would take the saw and cut the tree and tie it and everything. It was a family thing. Nineteen sixty eight all the way up to the nineteen seventies and eighties. As far as I can remember. And we're, here we are talking about something that happened long, long, long time ago in B.C. era and could not be bought. Oh, that's interesting. You can't buy the tree. In other words, if you want to go by the paganism, you are a heathen if you go down to a tree place and they're already pre-cut and you get money. Heck, even if you go to a tree farm, if you bought your tree... Ooh, what big sin you're doing. Don't buy your tree. Go steal it, I guess. <laughs> I didn't say that. I'm just reading what it says. So you're not to buy it. Or the superstitions associated with it would not apply. So if you bought the tree, you're not going to get good luck. In Babylonian paganism, the log placed in the fire represented a dead Nimrod. You know what Bible's like in men too? You know the guy that was blind and Jesus said, what do you see? He said, I see men as trees walking. You ever see where it talks about that there was this great tree, I forget what kind of tree it is, and it spread its wings out, it, it, its branches out, it was planted by waters, it's represented men and kings and all kinds. In the Bible, men are like in the trees. So is this practice. And the tree which appeared the next morning which today is called the Christmas tree. Oh, you mean the same con job? Children go off the bed while the parents linger around and lie about, I mean lie, as in telling the untruth, and then the kids wake up in the morning, there's trees all decorated and the presents and all that. A little magical trick. So the tree which appeared the next morning, which is called the Christmas tree to us, was Nimrod alive again, reincarnated into his new son, 
S-O-N and S-U-N Tammuz. Still today, some places the Yule log is placed in the fireplace on Christmas Eve, and the next morning there is a Christmas tree. And if you practice that, that's not in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's in the name of Tammuz. You need to, to, to move to Babylon. You need to get out of America and go to Iraq. Okay? Because that's where it comes from. Today, the Yule Log tradition comes to us from Scandinavia, where the pagan... How much is this? How many times does this happen? Sex and fertility god, Jewel. Capital J-U-L-E. Was honored in a 12-day celebration of in December. On the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. On the second day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. How many days is that song? It's 12. It's a Scandinavian pagan sex and fertility God song. With birds. You know what birds are, Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 4? You know what the maidens are doing with the cows? Do you know what Aaron did with a cow? Do you know what Jeroboam did with cows? I can't remember the rest of them, but I bet, bet you break down all 12, the, the 12 of those, uh, those presents or whatever you give during the 12 days of Christmas. I bet you they have some kind of... Uh, Pagan and anti-biblical scripture. A large single log was kept with a fire against it for 12 days. Each day for the 12 days a different sacrifice was offered. So in the song you have 12 different gifts. Boy, how does Satan sneak that song in? Because he's the song leader. The period now continuing as the 12 days began, excuse me, 12 days between Christmas and Epiphany. E P I P H A N Y. Was originally the 12 days of daily sacrifice offered to the Yule log. Oh, you mean the Nimrod? 12 days of sacrifice to, the, to Nimrod, who is the Yule log. I thought in the Old Testament and you were to offer offerings to God. I wonder if there's a sac I wonder if there's a feast in there. I don't know. But if there were one twelve days I know there were some seven days. But I don't know if there was a feast twelve days and maybe they're stealing from God for Nimrod. What then? Are we really going to, I mean what then are we really doing when we say Yule time greeting? Are we really honoring Christ by sending greens in the name of Scandinavian fertility God? Yuletide greens means sex and fertility greetings. Wow, that's really good. Oh. Greet that with the, with the people that come to your church through the front door. Sex and fertility greetings. Are we... Oh yeah, these... Are the same customs being practiced today in the ancient paganism? Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Just the facts, ma'am. Candles, number nine. Now, candles are not really that bad. Power goes out, you need a candle. If you go to church and there, there's no power, you light candles, you have a service. There was a time before electricity, churches would use candles. Candles are mentioned in the Bible. But let's read. See, you can take a good thing and you can turn it to sin. You know, you can take sex, which, which is a gift of God. God gave a man and a woman the, the ability to have sex. And look what Satan has done with it. Satan twisted it. 
Had you performed sex properly the way the Bible says you to do it, there would be no sexual diseases. Not a one. You get a typical man and woman who get married and do right and do what God wants them to do. They're not going to get a disease. So candles. Candles were lit by the ancient Babylonians in honor of their God and his altars had candles on them. They were written for the God. Not for worship God that we can read our Bibles or the hymnal or we can see the pastor. They were lit for the God. Now, if you light a candle for God, what's that going to do for him today? He is light. And as it is well known, candles are also a major part of the ritualism of the Roman Catholicism, which adopted the customs from the heathenism. They got it from Babylonia. Candles approach the Yule Log in ritual importance. Like the Yule Log, they had to be a gift, never purchased. You know, I grew up as a, as a Catholic, as a young boy. In order to burn a candle for prayers, I had to put money in a little drop box. So you need to go to your Catholic priest and say, Listen, buddy, the, the Babylonian practice is I wasn't supposed to buy it. You owe me some money back. And you know, they'll tell you, you're not buying a candle. You're, 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 you're paying, you know, as the candle burns and other people will pay for it too. It's always a con game. We're lighted and extinguished only by the head of the household. You know you would have a fight today doing this one between husband and wife to find out who's the, who's the head? Such candles stood burning steadily in the middle of the table. Middle of the table? Isn't that what they do in seances? Never to be moved or snuffed, least death follow. Now, you know where they stole that one? They stole that from the holy place. God's tabernacle, God's temple. That candle was not, that candlestick was not to ever to go out. You were to trim it. You were to fill the oil, but it was never to go out like it did in, in Samuel's time. Under a bad, wicked uh, priest named Eli, who didn't care about God. So this candle that's not supposed to go out is a copy, is an antichrist of the Bible. After all, if you're not to, to let God's candle go out, don't let God's candles go out. The Yule candle wreathed in greenery was to be burnt through Christmas night until the sun rose or the Christmas service began. And that is to be found in Sulgrave Manor, capital S U L G R A V E Manor, M A N O R, in his work of a tender or tutor, Christmas, page nine. Well, this not pulling stuff out of a hat here. I'm not just doing things to make it up. We're giving you the works. We're giving you the page numbers. We're giving you facts. We're giving you dates. We're giving you the names. Well, obviously, the candles should have no part in Christian worship. For nowhere in the New Testament is there you sanctioned. Well, you've got the candles, the candlesticks. Mention the type of the churches. It said one time that Paul was preaching at midnight. Well, I believe they had candles there. Because they had a guy fall out the window. You not would have seen him fall out the window if you didn't have a candle. Well, I know what he's saying. Candles were not used as a worship, as an object of worship. They were used for lighting. Okay. Number 10. Shall we stop? Giving of gifts. You're just really depressing me. Brother Style, you just ruined this whole thing for me. What could be wrong with gifts? Well, the Bible says that the gift of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. It says that the, in Romans 6, 23, the gift of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. But 
the point I'm going to make is it will come up in a minute. The tradition. There's the problem right there. Have you read what Jesus said about traditions? You worship man's traditions more than I mean you yeah, you worship more in man's traditions than you do what God has to say. Traditions of exchanging gifts has nothing to do with a reenactment of the Magi giving gifts to Jesus. And some of you didn't even think that, did you? You didn't even have the Magi in, when you got your presents. You were out there, charge it! Oh, okay, yeah, the Magi did it, Jesus. No, can't say that now. Don't say that. But has many superstitious, superstitious, pagan origins instead. So as a Christian, you can't say it's a Magi. One noticeable tradition was the Roman, tradition Roman. You notice how many times Roman has shown up? Custom exchanging food, trinkets, candles, or statues of gods, small g-o-d-s, during the winter caldas, capital K-A-L-E-N-D-S, the first day of the month in the ancient Roman calendar. This custom was transferred, moved, to December 25th by the Roman church. So something that was Roman, and then you got the Roman church taking something that was Roman, Roman pagan, and all we did, we just moved it to a different day. That's okay, God approved. No. This custom was transferred to December 25th by the Roman church, in keeping with the Sanitarium, capital S-A-T-U-R-N-A-L-I-A-N, you can get that in, in part two and part one. That's Saturn. Festival and celebration of giving, of the giving of St. Nicholas. Well, I can tell you too, St. Nicholas Day wasn't 25th either. His day is December 7th, the day he died. So you got a reverse of a birthday celebration. You got a, a celebration of someone who has died. Halloween. It is not the height of ridiculous claim that giving one another presents pro uh, properly celebrates Jesus' birthday. Not that there's anything necessarily wrong in giving each other presents. But what are we giving him? If we are indeed specially, specially, uh, specially celebrating his incarnation. And I know a church where they on December 25th, they have a birthday, get a cake for Jesus and everything like that. And you give gifts to Jesus. No, you give it to the church in a pastor. But why would you get in that nonsense after what we've looked at December 25th and looking at Christmas? And we're not done. You know, it's all wrong. You can't nitpick here. Number 12, when we get to it, I mean, for us, it's great. But I can't Say, get rid of all this, and, and we'll keep number 12 when we get to it. And James says, if you, if you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. All right, I don't have the Christmas tree. I've got rid of the Santa Claus. Uh, you got the, the gifts, the lights. We got rid of the lights, but we, you know, we're going to keep the tree. You can't do it. See, you know what I'm doing right now? I am giving you no more excuse as you're listening to this. You can't say to God, I don't know. And if you turn this off and say, I'm not going to go any further, God will obligate you to know because you still can keep on going unless he kills me or unless the rapture happens or for whatever reason I cannot finish this report. 
And if you are listening to this report, you cannot tell God, and I'm speaking to Christians only, at the judgment seat of Christ and say, I never knew about Christmas festival. And God will come back as the day you listen to this and say, Brother Stiley told you and read to you and given to the credit to the man that wrote this report for me, well, not for me, but finding it on the Internet, will get the credit in telling you what was to be done to do right. You can't serve God halfway. That makes him sick. Revelation 3, 15 and 16. Number 11. Some of you are probably like, what's number 12 he likes? We'll get to number 11 first. Christmas goose. I never had a goose. But the Christmas goose and Christmas cakes, whatever they are, were both used in the worship of the Babylonian Messiah. The goose was considered to be sacred. And in many ancient lands, such as Rome, Asia Minor, India, and Chaldea, in Egypt, the goose was symbol for a child ready to die. On Christmas, you celebrate the birth of Jesus, and in Egypt, it's the goose, a child that's ready to die. Abortion. Worshiping their, their children to Moloch, maybe. In other words, a symbol of the pagan Messiah ready to give his life supposedly for the world. Now this is obviously, obviously, this is exactly a satanic mockery of the truth. Yeah, Christ was born to die. Are you going to call Christ a goose? I know what it is. I remember, remember Tracy? Duck, duck, goose! Why wasn't duck, duck, pheasant? Okay, we're going to go to number 13. I, uh, I got to do number 12. Christmas ham. Oh, I love ham. I thank God I'm not under the law. You know, there's only one time I will not eat ham. If I'm in front of a Jew. Here we go. Hogs were slaughtered. And the eating the carcass was one of the central fest festivities of Saturn Elia. That's the Roman God of Christmas, December 25th. Each man would offer a pig as a sacrifice because superstition held that a boar had killed the sun deity Adeus. Capital A D O N I S. I believe we talked about that. In the first session, this god was killed by a pig. Oh. Hence the tradition of the Christmas ham on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. What are you saying, Brother Stiley? Now that you know having a ham on Christmas is in honor of Adanus or Deus, I don't know how to pronounce his name. You are now knowledge and, and knowledgeable that you know it's to a God. G-O-D. Small g. And Paul told you in, in the book of Corinthians, I forget which one. He said, if a man tells you that this is, he, he doesn't tell you about that thing. It was worship to a God. Go ahead and eat. But if he says that this was offered to, to Saturn, if this was offering to Diana, if this was offering to Balaam, if this was offering to a God, Paul said not to eat. So you can't have a ham on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. You now know. You know what all this is about? 
There are people out there who know all this stuff, or may know some of it. And they know you are born again, saved Christian, and see you practicing in it. You are giving them a license to continue in what they're doing. You are giving them a license to do wrong. And the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. In other words, you're not going to see me walking down the street with a Pepsi bottle or a bottle of water in a brown paper bag. Because what are you going to think it is? You're not going to see me by myself witnessing to a prostitute on the street. Because what do you think I'm doing? You're not going to see me walk into a bar to use the bathroom. What do you think I'm going to, what do you think I'm doing? I don't even go far as hugging other women. Aunts, relatives, or even that. Because what if someone else sees me hugging an aunt or a close friend that's a woman? Well, I know he's married. And he's hugging a woman that's not his wife. They're wrong. If it's not your wife, if it's not your husband, keep your cotton picking hands off them. Number 13. Christmas stockings. Uh, this one is it's, it's just so stupid. But according to the tradition, a, power, a poor widower of Myra, Turkey. Remember Myra? Remember who was from Myra? Had three daughters, from whom he could not pay, provide a dowry. On Xmas Eve, I like how he does that, St. Nicholas, now this is a story, has not been proven, threw three bags of gold down the chimney. What's he doing on their roof? Up on the housetop, click, click, click. I just saw it, old Saint Nick. I would think he's probably maybe looking at my daughters. Thereby saving the daughters from having to enter into prostitution. One bag rolled into a shoe, and the others fell into some stocking that had been hung to the dry, hung to dry by the fire with care. As I got too close in my underwear, burned my britches across the floor. Hence the beginning of the tradition of Christmas stockings or boot. Now, when I come up with my report about Santa Claus, you're going to find that. And you know that's been changed because it represents oranges or it was balls. of No one can make sure. And I have not found one person or one documented truth that that actually happened. So that's based upon a lie. I'm not saying the writer of this is, is lying. I'm saying the story is a lie. Okay, now. I'm guilty. Do I go back to... Do I, do I go to the post office? I'm guilty. Christmas cards, number 14. You see what I mean? Well, let's read this. The first British Xmas cards can be dated back to 1843. That's a date. That's a date. You can go back. The first cards featured pictures of dead birds. The birds are, Mark chapter 4, the popularity of hunting robin and wren on Christmas Day made the dead bird image appropriate for one on holiday cards. Not so good for the wren or the robin, but often the text of the cards would also have a morbid tone. You know what that means? I, I, I've studied this one before. It means they were filthy. Later, the cards displayed dancing insects. What kind of an, in, music they dance to? Playful children. Pink cheeked young women and festively decorated Christmas trees. The first actual Xmas cards were really Valentine's Day cards. 
with different messages, go back to the morbid tone, sent in December. You know the little candies that say, I love you and, and be mine? Well, these cards, I, I've, I've studied this, and this guy has proven on a fact with that they would be messages like that in the cards, but they were filthy. I can't even tell you what they said. Mass production of Xmas cards in the United States can be traced back to 1875. There's a date. Originally, the manufacturers thought of the Xmas cards as a sideline to their already successful business in playing cards. Oh, you mean the ones that made the, 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 the decks of cards made the cards for Christmas? But tradition of sending cards soon caught on, leading to a very profitable business by itself. Now, is that wicked? No, it's not. It just tells you what the future of the cards are. That's between you and the Lord. Oh, I love this one. Number 15, Christmas Carol. Let me stop. Let me stop right here. Because if I'm talking to a born again Bible believing Baptist, and I am, if I have not hit you in 14 aspects, I've got you a number 15. And remember, I told you, you cannot tell God, I never knew. You have no excuse. And I'm going to give you a warning right now. Number 15 is about Christmas carols and it's going to hit you. And if you turn it off, you will still be guilty. Let's read on. What do you suppose the reaction would be by a church leader if its pastor were to propose that the following hymns be introduced into the church and honor the birth of Christ. After all, the tunes are quite lovely. Hymn number one. A hymn by a Unitarian minister. Unitarians reject the Trinity and the full deity of Christ. To the Unitarian Christ is not God. That does not mention Jesus Christ and reflects the liberal social gospel theology of the 19th century. This hymn, number one, a hymn by a Unitarian minister that does not mention Jesus Christ and reflects the liberal social gospel theology of the 19th century. Do you want to know what that is? Let's do hymn number two. Hymn number two. A hymn by American Episcopal. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. You know Episcopal is what, what they do at their Lord's Supper. You know what kind of juice they use. <coughs> excuse me. Well, let me get my balance here. You can see them walking down the street with a paper bag. A hymn of American Episcopal priests. The fourth verse of which teaches a Roman Catholic superstition about Christ coming to be born in people during the Advent season. You want to hear that again? A hymn by American Episcopal priest, the fourth verse of which teaches Roman Catholic superstition. He crossed the fence line, went to the Roman Catholic. And Christ coming to be a born in people during the Advent season. You want to know what they are? Number three. Hymn number three. Come on, I want to know, I want to know. You can wait. Number three, hymn. A song, the words by an Austrian Roman Catholic priest, the music by a Roman Catholic school teacher, containing the Roman Catholic superstition about halos, proceeding from holy people, with no gospel message. And that's only three. 
Perhaps you would expect the church leaders to be upset, wouldn't you? And if you sing these songs in your church, and if I took a white paintbrush and went on your church sign and whited it out, Baptist, and put in black letters, the Roman Catholic Church, would you be upset with me, especially with hymn number three? Oh, we're a Bible-believing church. We wouldn't allow the Catholic doctrine in here. Wait till you find out what hymn number three is. It might surprise you to learn that they were upset when they suspected that the pastor might somehow prevert them from singing them. Excuse me, let me read that again. I'm wrong. I might surprise you to learn that they were upset when they when they suspected that the pastor might somehow prevent them from singing them. If you're a pastor to get up and say, we're not going to sing these three hymns, we're not going to allow it because it's Roman Catholic doctrine. It is doctrine that is not the Jesus Christ who is God and God is Jesus. The people in the church would be upset. You see those three hymns were already in the church hymnals. And you can find them in the church hymnals. Every single one of them. And I couldn't even find a song that I was singing to praise God the other day, but in an old hymnal. Out of three hymnals, I couldn't find this hymn, and it was about the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was biblical stance, and I couldn't find it, but in one hymnal. But these right here, they're in the hymnals of all I've seen. And they're sung all December. The pastor does not have to introduce them. And the three are theologically incorrect. The carols referred to above. Number one, I'm going to read it again. Ready? Number one, a hymn by a Unitarian minister that does not mention Jesus Christ and reflects the liberal social gospel theology of the 19th century. Remember, Unitarians reject the Trinity and the full deity in Christ. There is no Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ is not God. Are you ready? Number one is, It came upon the midnight clear. I just heard a, I just heard a chorus singing that. Number two, A hymn by American Episcopal priest, the fourth verse of which teaches Roman Catholic superstition, about Christ coming to be born in people during the Advent season. I don't even know what that one is. But here's American American Episcopal priest. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how we worship thee over Jesus. We just sang that last night. Number three. You are piping mad, some of you, right now. I had just kicked your God. And it's a small G-O-D. I'm happy I kicked it. And if you continue, you are a sinner, and you need to turn. Or your works will be burned. Not yourself. A song, the words by an Austrian Roman Catholic priest. The words by a Roman Catholic school teacher contained in a Roman Catholic superstition. Got it? Roman Catholic. About halos proceeding from holy people with no gospel message. We have the children get up here and perform the little thing so all the parents will get Jesus and we sing the songs about Jesus. The name of the hymn is Silent Night. Holy Fry, Roman Catholic, all the way through. Turn your hymnals into the pot of blue. You are wrong, and now God will hold you account. It came upon a midnight clear. God will kick you in the rear. It came upon a midnight clear. Old little town of Bethlehem and silent night have nothing to do with the Bible. 
are nothing written by no born again Christian and are just out lie lies, outright lies. We're going to close there on a great note. That's a great place to close. Give you time to, to cool down. Let the steam go away. Open up your radiator caps. Be very careful. The contents are very hot. It may scream into your face. So just let the hood up. Sit on the side of the road and pout and, 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 and pee your pants and get down on your knees and pray to God that God will work in your life and say, God, I am sorry. God, I didn't know. God, I plead the blood of Jesus. Help me to get right. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. I am so sorry, Lord, that I've done this. I am so sorry, Lord, that I allowed gods in my life. I am so sorry, Lord, I have kicked Jesus in the face. Lord, I can't wait the next time, the next recording that he does to read about more sin in my life, to repent and get right and put it under the blood.